All right, so now we're going to be discussing Star Wars on Laserdisc. I wanted to do a whole separate video for this because it's by far the most common question myself and anyone interested in Laserdisc hears all the time. And uh, most people are thinking or hoping that they can get the original editions of the Star Wars trilogy in their unaltered theatrical forms on any form of older uh, disc or tape format. Unfortunately, that's not exactly the case. However, going to Laserdisc will get you the best video quality on an official release of the closest official release to the unaltered theatrical version. Now for most people, uh, this is going to be what they're looking for. This is pre-special edition changes, so on and so forth, but it must be understated again that this is not 100% the original theatrical unaltered version. Uh, those really have not been issued on home video. They've kind of been, uh, like any film, uh, you know, they'll use an interpositive and transfer it and the color will be a bit different. It has to fit within the disc parameters and the technical parameters of the time period. Uh, the original film was remixed for home video uh, on several occasions. So were the two sequels. So um, I'm going to go through the history of some of these. First, I'd like to explain uh, the original runs on Laserdisc were uh, CBS, Fox, Pan and Scan Discs, and uh, they are, um, you know, surprisingly good for the era, and uh, feature usually Dolby Stereo soundtracks, sometimes analog only, and a few in both uh, the U.S. and Japan had digital soundtracks. Now, some really dedicated fans have tracked out tracked down some of those and found that some actually do contain a version of the uh, 1977 Dolby Stereo. However, those are uh, rather difficult to find, and a number of the pan and scan releases, particularly of Star Wars itself, are also time compressed. So that's another thing you'll have to deal with if you're interested in the earliest versions in, uh, at Laserdisc quality. So um, I don't think that Empire and Jedi were time compressed uh, to the degree that Star Wars releases were, but with the old pan and scan discs, that's always a possibility. I'm really just going to be talking primarily about the major widescreen letterbox releases and uh, those masters pretty much explain the history of Star Wars on home video in the more modern era on both uh, tape and laserdisc. So to start, we're going to start with the uh, original letterbox issue and this was the first letterbox master made of the film. This is the Japanese special collection from 1985. Uh, they did all three films in the trilogy and matching special collection boxes like this with original poster artwork. And these covers are absolutely gorgeous, but uh, unfortunately this is a little dinged up and it doesn't have the original Obi strip. Uh, that's because these are, you know, exceptionally rare and very expensive. Uh, usually people track these down by paying through the nose on eBay or uh, going to Japan themselves or using the very helpful Good Squid. Uh, who is uh, a really great uh, servicer and procurer of Japanese laser discs for uh, enthusiasts here in the States and Europe and the UK, so on and so forth. So they are definitely out there if you're after them. But unfortunately, I only have the uh, special collection disc for Star Wars, but it will allow me to explain uh, what this series of masters means. So again, it was 1985, and this was the first time the films were uh, presented letterboxed with their original widescreen scope width on home video. Uh, they used a really nice source. They have very good color, very good detail for the time. They're fully CAV encoded, which is, of course, a great bonus. And they all three have uh, digital surround encoded uh, PCM soundtracks with uh, Dolby Stereo um, encoding. So they'll still sound great, and they'll still sound roughly like the theatrical release. However, for Star Wars, for some reason, uh, it was decided to do a brand new uh, remix for home video. It's also referred to nowadays as the 1985 home video remix. It's basically uh, taking the 1977 Dolby Stereo Matrix, which was the four channels matrix down into two channels, so you could listen to it listen to it in either stereo or matrix back out in four channel and this is what you would have heard on the general 35 millimeter release prints if the theater uh, got the Dolby stereo print instead of the later mono print um, but what they did in 1985 I believe Ben Burt is the one who is credited as supervising this it essentially uh, takes that mix and uh, narrows the dynamic range a bit because of course equipment and home equipment particularly at that time 
uh, couldn't really reproduce the same dynamics as a, uh, a theatrical audio mix. So it's essentially, for lack of a better term, tamed a bit for home systems. Uh, if you put this side by side with the Dolby Stereo, you'll notice a difference. Uh, you know, the, there's there's less dynamic range in it, but other than that, it's it, pretty much identical. Uh, the only other thing that it actually changes is it adds C-3PO's line about the uh, tractor beam location uh, during the scene in the Death Star control room, and that was originally put into the mono mix. In the original Dolby Stereo and 70 millimeter mixes, uh, that scene is silent when the blueprints flash on the uh, terminal screen. Uh, so it was felt that uh, it needed to be clarified, so they added 3PO's mix line in the mono mix, which was the final mix done, and the one that had all of the additional lines and errors corrected like that, and uh, because that was actually intended to be the definitive mix. And of course, most of those mono changes made it into the 1997 special edition mix later on down the road. So if you've heard those before, uh, that's the source of them. But anyway, uh, pretty much every release after this uh, all of the uh, U.S. letterbox releases before the definitive set uh, used this same master and the same 1985 audio track. So uh, this really spawned a whole lot of stuff. And of course, the letterbox uh, VHS releases uh, before uh, in the early 90s also used this. So you've probably seen this at some point or another, this master, I mean. Now the rear cover... You look here, the design is pretty much what you would see on the back of any CBS Fox uh, Laserdisc jacket in the Pan and Scan era or on VHS or Beta. But the credits have been placed here on the top with an older Fox logo here and all of the information is presented down here in the usual Japanese style. So it does give it a more prestigious look and feel, which is quite nice. And also, before I forget, it's a little dinged up, but the actual spine, the top is actually printed in gold, just like the uh, special collection uh, is printed in a uh, gold letter font on the front cover. So that's another little nice touch that makes it look nice and pop out on a shelf. Now the other nice thing about these is that while they are fully CAV, they actually do come with specific special collection uh, disc sleeves with the original logo and the sides. Now these are just you know glossy paper but it's it's a nice touch and they actually will also they have the um, the chapter stops are not only written in Japanese but under them they're actually subtitled in English so that will help you if you want to uh, go to a specific chapter and you're not fluent in Japanese as I'm not either show you the disc label. It's pretty straightforward. It is a, you know, it, it's it's simple. It's a CBS Fox white and blue label, but it, it does look quite nice, and it does still have the Special Collection moniker on there, so that's a nice touch. Now, of course, being a Japanese disc, it does have the hard-coded Japanese subtitles at the bottom, and uh, in order to facilitate these, the entirety of the image has been shifted up in the uh, video letterboxing area. And so that makes it very easy to, uh, you know, mask out the subtitles. If you don't like having to read hard-coded subtitles, it's very easy to just get. I, I personally use a piece of black foam board that I've cut out, and I can just set it in front of my TV or use, I use some painter's tape to ta actually tape it to the sides of my TV, and that's uh, a very easy way to mask that off. However, because it's been shifted up, if you're used to using zoom functions on your display device to uh, you know, properly zoom out scope or letterbox titles on Laserdisc or DVD, uh, that might cause you some problems because it's been shifted up. And so you might lose uh, portions of the image if you do that without actually checking. So you'll have to play around with it if you go for this release. Um, because you, you may have to make some adjustments because the image has been shifted up so high. Now, they, the special collections for Empire and Jedi are also CAV, packaged in the same manner with original poster artwork. Unfortunately, due to their rarity and expense, I've never been able to track either one down, but I have seen them, and there have been many uh, 
fan preservations to uh, capture these on various players and equipment. So if you wonder what they really look like, it's very easy to see um, you know, screen captures and so on and so forth so you can really get a sense of what they look like. Uh, with anything Star Wars, go check out OriginalTrilogy.com. There are hundreds and thousands of threads on these topics. We, we've all done them to death. And uh, the Japanese Special Collection is usually abbreviated as JSC, and that's the abbreviation I'm going to use for the rest of this video to refer to them. So if you're wondering what I mean by that, or you're wondering what that means if you read it somewhere, it's referring to the Japanese Special Collection. Now. When these were brought over to the United States, it actually took them a couple years. Why, nobody really knows, but instead of striking new masters, in 1989, Fox apparently just took the uh, Japanese master and decided it was good enough for all three films to be released over here in the States. Unfortunately, they just released it as a normal Fox letterbox title without the CAV encoding or any extras. This resulted in the special widescreen edition of the original trilogy. And these are by far the most commonly available letterbox laserdiscs of the original trilogy in the United States. They're also the cheapest. And uh, it's honestly the one I recommend to people looking for uh, the trilogy. And, you know, they're just getting into laserdisc or they don't want to spend an arm and a leg. And to be quite frank, there are actually reasons why I, pr I prefer this series over any others. So, again, it uses original poster artwork. These all three look quite nice for the time period. And for this style of design, the jackets look excellent. Of course, it's from 1985, sorry, 1989. So it still has the CBS Fox logo on here. The gatefold is quite nice. The chapter stops are listed on the left side. And in the center, you have Vader on the Tantive IV. Show the spine there. And then here, you have a typical Fox-style paragraph blur, but a bit longer than usual, and kept over here to the side, which is nice, instead of just having a bunch of wasted space inside a gatefold. Now, the printing's quite nice, too, which is always cool. And the rear conforms to the standard gray CBS Fox widescreen design. Uh, pretty much similar text to the other video releases of this era. And it does have the Dolby Surround en encoded uh, digital tracks. Now, since this is the same as the Japanese Master, uh, essentially you take a slight hit in the picture quality because it's CLV versus full CAV. However, you don't have to flip sides as much, so that's always the uh, trade-off you run into. Uh, the audio is is the same, so it's the same mix as PCM. You're not losing anything. So, um, but the only issue that arose with this, and it wasn't really discovered for a long time, uh, is the fact that because they used the Japanese master and it had been shifted up to accommodate the subtitles, uh, it caused an error at some point. And um, you know, nine, nine out of ten people really aren't going to notice this. But if you actually pay attention watching this disc. Uh, the image ratio, the aspect ratio of the image will actually shrink over time. If I remember correctly, it starts somewhere on side two uh, during the Death Star sequences, and it slowly starts to, um, let me see if I can illustrate this, it essentially slowly starts to shrink inwards and inwards and inwards until by the uh, Battle of Yavin conclusion, it's uh, quite a bit narrower. Now, this disc is still perfectly watchable. And uh, you know, it, if you're looking for it, you will notice it. It's referred to by many fans as the incredible shrinking ratio. Um, so the uh, shrinking ratio is noticeable. And I believe that's what caused them to do a run of corrected pressings, which were done at uh, three different pressing plants, Pioneer, Mitsubishi, and Technodisc. Uh, of course, they didn't really publicize this, and the shrinking ratio was only discovered by a uh, member on Original Trilogy a couple years back. Um, so I don't know if it was really publicized very much in the early 90s. But uh, just before the next series, the Definitive Collection killed off all the early letterbox releases. Uh, right before the Definitive Box came out, they did a quiet repressing, which is one I'm going to go over now. And this is probably the most important part of this entire video. Now here is the corrected repressing. Now you'll notice it's the exact same jacket design. The catalog numbers are practically identical. Uh, if you were to hold them in your hand side by side, 
Uh, the older release has a slight glossiness to the jacket, whereas this has more of a, a flat finish. But the big key giveaway is, uh, you know, aside from the printing seeming a little deeper because this was done at about uh, 1992, early 93, is that the CBS Fox logo has changed over to the modern Fox video logo from the early 90s. That's usually going to be the easiest way to tell the versions apart and see that you have a corrected copy without the shrinking ratio. Now, the gatefold is exactly the same. Uh, some of the font has been changed around very, very slightly, but again, uh, you're just going to notice the uh, printing is a little bit deeper in the color and it has more of a flat finish as opposed to the more glossy jacket of the earlier release. I also think the cardboard is a little thinner on this one, but that's just because I'm, I can actually put them side by side. Now the rear also seems the same, but another way to tell some of these apart is again, you have the modern Fox Video logo on there. And on the older release, it said that the discs are made in Japan, and this one, they're actually credited as being made in the USA. That's another way to tell them apart, but what's really interesting on this release and what's really important and was unknown for a very long time, uh, the discs that were pressed by Mitsubishi and Pioneer essentially corrected the issue on the old master of the uh, original 89 disc, and it's just a reissue with that corrected. However, the Technodisc version, for some unknown reason, is a completely different master. It seems to use uh, perhaps a different source element or a, uh, a newer scan of that same uh, inner positive, but for some reason, it has better detail, it, it, phenomenal color, and is the single best looking laser disc of Star Wars that is out there. Um, unfortunately, because it's from the Technodisc plant, uh, can be prone to crosstalk in the image, as all Technodisc uh, copies of any laser disc title are. So that is something you know to be aware of. Technodisc was one of the, one of the smaller plants and didn't really get as much of the big business as Pioneer and Mitsubishi and. Um, Rot City DADC. Sorry, bad joke. Uh, but anyway, uh, it is unknown why this happened, and it was really found again by accident on one of the original trilogy threads. But it is so good that I actually think, and a lot of others do as well, that it's better than the CAV Special Collection Japanese disc. And this is what I recommend people to go out and find. This is better than any other release on Laserdisc, and the sad truth is it's still the best official release of Star Wars on any home video format to this day uh, due to the uh, incessant alterations and damaging of the uh, film's power and strengths due to the multiple uh, special editions and video special editions and botched bad sound mixes and horrible color timing choices and I could go on for 10 years about that stuff but anyway long story short the audio track is still the same 1985 home video remix and again if you watch Star Wars on video anytime between 1985 and 1993 uh, before the definitive set kind of replaced everything, you'll be very used to this mix because this was used on everything during that time period. So if you can track one of these down, I highly recommend it, but you're going to have to be patient because not only will the jacket indicate it's a layer pressing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a Technodisc copy. What you're going to have to do is actually identify the discs themselves by the mint markings on the inner ring. And this gets very difficult because when you're looking at discs online, you're going to have to actually ask sellers to read you the disc codes. And of course, that's uh, easier said than done. So let me see if I can... I don't know if this is ever going to be visible on here, but what you have to do is actually take the laser disc itself and there's actual... Uh, mint markings inside the inner ring just like the dead wax of a uh, record LP and just like a record where you can identify pressing plants uh, mastering engineer signatures and uh, stamper numbers plate numbers so on and so forth you can do the same and identify uh, what plant made what disc 
So if you actually look in here, Technodisc will actually list its Technodisc. They have a little uh, square with a circle in it logo, and it has the mint marking numbers. Now, if you look up the film's LDDB page, they actually have the mint marking numbers for Pioneer, Mitsubishi, and Technodisc on there. So if you're ever in a store and you come across a copy, or you're online and uh, you want to see if that's correct, you can just look that up on the Laserdisc database and uh, see which plant it's from. But with these Technodisc versions, it's very easy because it actually has Technodisc printed on there. So again, I cannot stress the importance of this Technodisc reissue pressing enough. Uh, this is by far and large one of the best Laserdiscs I own. It's extraordinarily important and no one knows why they got a, a, a new master or made a new master of their own. It is completely unknown. And like I said, it was discovered entirely by chance. So this is the one to go for. This is, if, if you have this, then you're pretty much set for Star Wars on Laserdisc. Uh, as I said before, it has the uh, PCM version of the 85 home video remix, and it has the best picture quality, arguably, of any version, even better than the JSC previously. So I would highly recommend this, but you will have to be very patient. It took me uh, at least three or four years just to find one. Um, and you know, many uh, messages to eBay sellers, checking every copy I came across. So um, definitely try and find one, but you'll have to, as I said before, actually check the discs themselves. Don't just go by the reissue logos on the uh, front and back. Now, as for Empire and Jedi, it's a lot easier. <laughs> And even though there are Technodisc pressings, you don't have to worry about which plant you get a copy from because they're all pretty much the same. And as I mentioned before, Technodisc uh, pressings can be prone to crosstalk and things. So on uh, Empire and Jedi, uh, I know people who have gotten Technodisc versions and pretty much across the board, if you have any version of the special widescreen editions of Empire and Jedi, you're pretty much gonna be good to go. So here, of course, is the Empire release. Now here they've gone with the gray type bar that they used on a number of uh, Fox SWEs. Original poster artwork looks very gorgeous on this. The old CBS Fox logo is here. Shaded gatefold. Designed similarly to Star Wars with the blue and then the red bars at the top. I, I don't know what that's supposed to signify, but at least they, you know, uh, kept continuity in the jackets. There's a... Uh, Nice rendering of a Yoda still, and again, the images are printed very well. They have really nice color to them. So, pretty much, uh, you know, very much akin to what you would have gotten on the uh, uh, printed images on the Empire uh, soundtrack LP release back in the day. At least that's what it makes me think of. Now, here's the rear cover. Uh, and it's it's a little bit lighter of a gray. There are a number of Fox releases that have this slightly different color. I don't know why, but that, that's just something I've noticed. Uh, as a nice touch, they've added the Lucasfilm actual uh, logo here, which is, I think, pretty cool. I like it when they add uh, additional logos. Uh, of course, this is letterboxed with the uh, Dolby Surround encoded PCM track. Uh, it seems pretty much identical to the uh, 1980 Dolby Stereo from the general 35mm release prints. Uh, but again, without being able to compare them side by side and you know check it 100% to see if it's completely identical. Um, if experience has told Star Wars fans anything until you can actually compare uh, the original source to all the other versions, you cannot 100% call it completely authentic. So uh, that being said, it does pretty much seem like the uh, theatrical stereo audio track. It has really nice dynamic range and again is based on the Japanese Special Collection Master. But again, it doesn't have the issues that Star Wars did and uh, it, it looks great across the board. So you're basically going to be able to get the JSC Empire disc here for you know, $5 or less, as opposed to an exorbitant amount for the JSC disc. Of course, that is CAV, so you will get the uptick in uh, visual quality over this CLV release. But that being said, the color and the detail is still very nice on this, so 
uh, this is the version of Empire that I would recommend to anybody for uh, a regular NTSC US uh, laser disc pressing. Moving on to Jedi, it's pretty much the same thing, except now they've gone with the black bar, which fills in very well with the original one sheet artwork. Again, it's uh, slightly older, so you do have the CBS Fox video logo on the bottom. Uh, pretty much, Star Wars was the only one that got the later pressings because of the uh, reissue fix. So all the copies of Empire and Jedi you're going to come across are all going to be off this original run. Show you the interior. Again, nice usage of stills across the gatefold without a whole lot of dead space. And again, to me, it just feels like um, what you would have gotten if you had a uh, gatefold soundtrack release. Now, I do like that it's on black. There's a little dead space here, but at least it has some nice text. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't have the same blue with red uh, blocks as the other two. But uh, again, continuity was not always kept between uh, individual disc releases. So I'm that's just a minor notice. It's not even a, really a complaint or anything. Now here's the rear. Again, pretty similar. And uh, just the standard Fox style rear cover. Uh, Dolby surround encoded digital track. Again, it sounds pretty much identical to what we would think the uh, Dolby stereo uh, optical on the 35 millimeter general release prints look like. But again, until you can actually go through and do a like-for-like -like comparison between the two, uh, you know, I, I can't swear and officially say that this is the original Dolby Stereo track. That said, just like Empire, this is based on the Japanese Special Collection disc. It has really nice color and detail, and the sound is very dynamic and punchy and sounds great. Uh, of course, it's not CAV like the JSC disc, so you do have to, you know, you take a little hit there. But something else I should mention about all of these, uh, another member on Original Trilogy did a really in-depth study of the audio tracks and found that um, the audio quality itself, the encoding job done on the PCM, uh, seems to be actually slightly better on these special widescreen edition discs than the original Japanese Special Collection discs. This is really kind of getting into audiophile territory, but if you were to sit there and put them side by side, um, especially if you captured them and put them in Audacity or some other type of sound editing program and really get in nitty gritty on the waveforms, um, there is an actual difference. So uh, even though you do lose slightly on the picture quality, you do actually gain a tiny bit on the audio side of things. And again, if you're gonna put these side by side, you'll notice the difference, but if you were just watching these American CLV discs, uh, you'd be totally happy. The color's great, the detail's nice, and uh, they're just wonderful across the board. And again, they're very plentiful. They're the cheapest editions out there, and uh, I recommend everybody to pick up this series if you're looking for Star Wars on Laserdisc, the special widescreen editions, and be sure and at least get a corrected copy of Star Wars, but also track down the Technodisc variant. All right, so this is what most of you probably came here for or are interested in looking at. This is, of course, the Star Wars Trilogy Definitive Collection, uh, released in 1993. This was the uh, brand new THX remastering of all three films with additional features added. And uh, these masters were uh, then reused for the big final push, uh, referred to as One Last Time, on both uh, VHS and Laserdisc as the Faces covers, which we'll go over in just a minute. Uh, but this box set is very legendary, very well thought of and sought after among Laser Laserdisc aficionados. And uh, a lot of people remember growing up with these or seeing them in stores with the super large price tag on it. But uh, for as Laserdisc boxes go, it's, it's a really nice, just wonderful looking piece of art. But of course it's very large, very heavy, which uh, makes shipping charges for these uh, quite exorbitant and they're very prone to getting dinged up. Uh, as I'll show you this one, uh, it's, it's got a little bit of wear and tear on it, but uh, the seller actually gave me a choice between two. Uh, and of course I had to pick and choose between <laughs> what damage I could live with. 
Now, uh, the outer box, of course, has this embossed uh, silver trilogy design. This sort of stencilized looking font with the original logo was used on the tape releases uh, around this time period. There was one last letterbox release of tapes uh, that uh, was in a box set and used this font in red with a holographic foil logo. And that was actually the first and only letterbox release of the uh, older masters from the special widescreen edition on VHS. So if you don't have a laser disc player or you're still collecting VHS and you come across those, those are the best quality you could get on VHS tape in terms of the original editions and have good color and good sound and stuff. Uh, on, but of course, we're still talking about VHS resolution versus laser disc resolution, but just to, for your own consideration. Now, try and show you the spine. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this because trying to hold this up is kind of difficult. I'm not sure if I can get it at the right angle, but you know, it's it's very nicely done. You have the Fox logo, the Star Wars trilogy definitive collection, and then the titles of each of the three films. And then you get the Laserdisc logo and the THX Laserdisc logo. It's also very common for these spines to get damaged. This has a little bit of wear on the corner there, but it's not bad. And I should also mention that the material almost has a uh, leathery feel to it. So that's another nice touch. Of course, I do really like the uh, promo shot that was used on a lot of materials back in 1977 and 78, and a lot of things since of the X-Wing uh, firing at the TIE Fighter has been imprinted here right down to the Starfield. Now the rear is pretty simple. It just gives you the legality stuff and the Fox THX and CBS Fox logos there. Um, I don't know, I suppose this would have originally come with a paper insert on the back kind of taped to it or maybe in the shrink wrap, uh, but it didn't come with this one. I don't know if that's the case or not, but that's what I would assume. Now, this opens with this flap here. It's actually got a piece of Velcro in it, and the Velcro is very prone to tearing on copies. So that's something you'll have to be aware of. And then slotted in here rather nicely are the three films and the hardcover uh, printing of the George Lucas Creative Impulse book, uh, which is a rather nice, if somewhat dated, look at uh, Lucas's career to that point. Me, these are done in here, as, even though they're solidly protected, it's rather tight trying to get everything out. So you have to be kind of careful, make sure you don't harm anything. Now the book and booklet are actually protected very well. Uh, they're put behind the discs and they actually have a little um, kind of stopper built into the top back side of the box to keep them uh, from sliding around and just being loose like a lot of box sets were and also from being uh, crushed by the discs themselves so that's a nice touch. Once you get used to handling this it might be become a little bit easier but er since everything is rather tight you'll have to be aware of that lest you ding stuff up simply trying to get it in and out of the box. Now the booklet is um, it's sort of stiffened on the uh, outer cover so that keeps it from getting dinged up and gives it a little bit of nice weight. Now there's not a lot of information in here, but the way it's printed is actually very nice, very informative, and almost makes me feel like it's uh, a section of like the old Bantha Tracks magazine or the old Star Wars Insider, um, which really made me feel like I was going down memory lane when I finally managed to get a copy of this box set. So as you can see, here's the LaserDisc production credits and then talking a little bit about the THX program and its introduction and how it was applied to Star Wars. And then here's a bit about key cast and crew members. Seeing this sort of stuff and the way it's written just really uh, it again makes me feel like I'm reading the old fan club magazines. Now each film has a section about it, a page of background and introduction, and then basically getting into the chapter stops. Now all three films are CAV encoded and they each have uh, digital PCM tracks with a brand new surround mix and then they have a analog commentary 
Unfortunately, the audio commentary, even though it's from different uh, individuals, it doesn't run for the entirety of the feature. And uh, basically, if you were to cut all of the uh, interview portions together, it's like half an hour to an hour per film. And then the rest is just filled in with score and uh, I think some bits of dialogue and music effects and stuff. So it's not like a full length audio commentary, but it's still really nice to have. And some material in there is really great. But just be aware it doesn't it's not one that you're going to be able to listen to for the full two hours show you here and again it's just basically giving you the chapter stops printed in a nice accompanying booklet here we move over to empire that's same thing But again, for the time period, this was, you know, considered extremely extensive. You know, the fact that everything was printed in a booklet with actual, you know, listings of commentary information. And I, I love the layout of this. And, and like I said, it, all, I, all I can do is look at this and think this, this just looks exactly like the fan club material stuff that I grew up on. So it's a wonderful, wonderful little booklet. Sorry, page stuck together. And here's Jedi. And the rear. So again, it's pretty much just a chapter stop book, though, but it was it was a nice touch to actually have it printed. Now here is the special printing of the Creative Impulse. And here again, they've repeated the X-Wing and TIE, TIE Fighter and it's actually printed on the book, which is quite nice. And it's it's a full on hardcover printing, you know, so it's, it's, it's really nice and sturdy. There is the spine, also printed in the same style and it's slightly got a uh, metallic tint to it, which is pretty cool. As I said before, everything in here, of course, has been outdated because this is a you know 1993 printing. Uh, but there's still a lot of really great information in here, a lot of great you know vintage photos and things, and it's always nice to see something from you know before the digital era, from pre-internet days, when information was a lot more limited. But just to give you an idea, it's filled with all kinds of really nice photos and things. So it's it's really a nice read even if you pretty much already know most of everything that's in here but it was just really nice for somebody to actually include the entirety of a book inside a box set usually you just get a uh, you know an excerpt or a small booklet version and if I remember correctly I think the uh, letterbox VHS set or one of them had a small excerpted version of this same book so uh, because I obviously couldn't fit this whole thing inside of a uh, VHS box. Now, this themselves are presented in these slip sleeves that are, you know, very simplistic, but I guess the idea was to make it seem, you know, even more important by not even having any art on it. But you do get the stylized trilogy logo. The rear has the credit information, and uh, Enos and black and sort of blue at this styling and being larger makes me think of the uh, JSC rear cover so that's that's interesting you get the THX stamp there now when you slip the actual sleeves out uh, very much like the JSC they have their own individual slip sleeves on a starry background again uh, nothing special in terms of the sleeves they're just printed on a star background and have the Fox video logo but as you can see the disc labels themselves have the special trilogy logo on them and our for Star Wars here it's this light kind of beige color so at least they have some type of you know exclusive uh, disc label to them which is always a nice touch and again, they're fully CAV encoded, so you will have to flip sides quite a bit, but you do get the 
benefit of having CAV trick play options. Here's Empire. Again, same design. You're just basically getting a <laughs> different title on here. And here's the rear with the credits. And then, then the disc now has a blue label instead. Here is the Return of the Jedi sleeve. And, and the rear cover. And just like the box set itself, I will admit it, these uh, sleeves with the disc insider are actually packed quite tightly in there. So it'll take you a minute to get one of them out. And here is the Jedi disc. And they've gone for a sort of like off gray green color. So at least you can tell the films apart in that manner. Now, the what we have to talk about now is the tech specs and the new master and everything. So the THX remastering went back to an inner positive and transferred them with a uh, basically a very early version of digital video noise reduction. So they were hit with quite a lot of that and the result is that the master, although they're CAV, CAV encoded and were at the highest technical possibility at that time, uh, the color levels are severely dropped, so uh, in a lot of instances things can look washed out and very contrasty, and uh, even in comparison to the older releases, the uh, color is much lesser. And uh, they, the noise reduction removed a lot of grain but left other nasties around. Uh, the worst is uh, visible motion smearing, and this becomes really apparent when you look at the uh, DVD ports released as the uh, original edition bonus DVD on the individual DVDs of the original trilogy. Um, fans now refer to those as the Gout or George's official unaltered trilogy. And they took the masters for these and pressed them on a uh, DVD as non-anamorphic. Uh, but looking at those makes it even more obvious. But you can even see it on here. Uh, things when they move across the screen can leave a trail of themselves. There's tons of documented information. If you just check out the original trilogy site or most anywhere, you can find out about this stuff. Uh, but even if you compare them side by side, uh, an older um, widescreen disc versus this. Now, that's not to say that these are necessarily you know, bad or subpar, but they do have those issues baked in. Uh, additionally, there were several changes made primarily in the audio tracks with these brand new Dolby Surround encoded mixes. Uh, they were designed to better optimize the home theater scene at the time and what most consumers with high-end gear had in their homes with uh, Dolby Pro Logic decoders. So the surround steering, you know, is, is a bit more opened up and improved. And uh, some of the sound effects have been uh, slightly changed and a few things added and moved around and uh, but pretty much uh, Star Wars was supposed to have used the 70 millimeter six track audio as a base and then uh, obviously mixed down into four channel for Pro Logic and then uh, the new effects were applied and uh, added and moved around. Uh, case in point, the one that always jumps out to me is during the uh, detention block break-in while uh, Chewie's ostensibly being a prisoner getting loose when the uh, various cameras are being destroyed. They've added sound effects of breaking glass on some of them being shot with blasters. So um, you'll, that's one of those you can notice right off the bat and that was introduced here in this mix. But uh, again, they seemingly we're supposed to use the 70 millimeter audio as a base. So it's very dynamic, very punchy, and sounds great in a home theater environment on the this uh, PCM rendering. Uh, Empire and Jedi seem relatively similar to the older discs. It doesn't seem like they were really remixed to the same degree. Uh, really just kind of probably improved in their uh, fidelity on disc and uh, just brought into um, you know, uh, four channel matrix for Laserdisc. Uh, that being said, there are a couple things here and there that are different. Uh, for example, during the Battle of Hoth, there's a, uh, a there's a missing uh, a sound effect when a snow speeder crashes in this mix as opposed to the uh, older disc. I'm, if I'm remember, remembering correctly, I think that's where it is. So there are one or two minor little things here here and there on those audio tracks that are a little bit different. But again, they sound great and they have nice fidelity. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a really nice set for what it is. However, 
there are other things to consider. These can be very prone to laser disc rot. Um, so if you're even interested in one of these, you have to find one that's either a later pressing or doesn't have rot or isn't rotted too bad uh, because they can get very bad uh, rot and sometimes it just affects certain sides. It, it's just up across the board. This title is known for being uh, rot capable. And then the other thing to find is the original pressings had an error where at one of the side breaks in Empire Strikes Back, it cuts uh, several seconds from the film. It's the uh, scene where Leia is welding just before uh, she and Han have the uh, memorable first kiss aboard the Falcon uh, during its uh, repairs. So if you look at the scene on any version, uh, where Leia has a welding torch and has some goggles on and is trying to repair something on the Falcon. And uh, on the first pressings of the Definitive Collection, that section is just missing. So it had to be corrected on later pressings of this box set. So you'll uh, notice uh, listings for this. If the seller is very knowledgeable, it will say something about Leia welding present or Leia welding is missing. And that's what that refers to. Um, I believe there's a list somewhere online of all the various things that are, uh, you know, uh, exclusive to this box set in terms of oddities here, uh, here and there. So you can look that up if you're really, really curious. But uh, these go for a premium dollar nowadays. eBay listings for these can easily go over $100. Um, and the shipping, as I mentioned before, because it's so big and heavy, can be very exorbitant. So. If you're at all interested in this, it's it, you're going to have to do your detective work first and really research it and you know check with the seller and make sure it doesn't have any rot. See if it has the Leo welding scene in it and that uh, you know it's complete with the book and the booklet and the box is actually in good shape. So it's not one that you can just easily go out and pick up at the store, but if you actually come across one locally, you can you know get a nice lucky find. But that being said, uh, since the, the transfers have the inherent deficiencies and the price is so high, I really recommend people uh, to go with these special widescreen earlier discs because you get better color, um, arguably I, I'd say better sound in terms of it being um, less tweaked and uh, altered. And the versions on here are easily available much more cheaply in their standalone faces variety which is what we're going to discuss next. Now, the reason why these are called faces is that they use a design with a character face across the side, as a lot of things in, um, in the 90s video world did, uh, primarily the uh, Universal Monsters VHS tapes in the early 90s and the MGM UA uh, James Bond mid 90s VHS releases all kind of used uh, character in the front and then the background with the title here. Now what these did was essentially uh, repress the definitive masters onto CLV movie only discs. But what's great about these is that they have no rod issues and are significantly cheaper than the box set and are of course much easier to fit on your shelf and ship and uh, thus much cheaper. Now, uh, the other thing to note is that certain copies were pressed by the Kuroway plant, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Kuroway or Kuroway, I don't know how it's pronounced. And uh, some of them are reputed to have been pressed with Super NTSC encoding. Uh, Super NTSC, and you can look this up if you're really interested in the technical specs, uh, was essentially a, a way they tried to uh, process extra information and uh, you know do a better job of compression on the uh, video format bandwidth and then what you would do is have a super NTSC decoder box that you would run your video in and out of to your TV and the idea was that um, and this was really more geared towards the professional realm it was just a way to in to get more out of the video format but it never really took off in the consumer realm and was pretty much locked to the uh, professional realm. Kuraway was the one plant that seemingly encoded a lot of their discs with it anyway. So if you were to get a Super NTSC decoder or wanted to play around with it, uh, their pressings of the faces discs uh, seem to have that on there. So that is an interesting technical note. Now, the gate folds are pretty straightforward. 
That's a nice use of an image across with some good text. And then the chapter stops here. And of course, since it's CLV, you don't have to flip sides like crazy. They also included the Leonard Maltin interviews with George Lucas that were placed at the beginning of the uh, VHS Faces tape. So if you've seen those and are familiar with them, they're placed at the end of the uh, Faces disc. So that's a nice little exclusive to these. Now the rear is pretty nice. At least it's stylized to the film. And, it, you know, it, it just looks nice, and it's nice to have something different for a, a Laserdisc jacket, particularly from Fox on the rear cover. So I, I wish I had the uh, A New Hope and Empire discs of these, but because anything Star Wars automatically gets a high premium price attached to it, and because I have the definitive box, uh, I, I, you know, those are just, if I ever find them at a cheap price someday, which I hope to, just to complete the set, but... Um, if you have a non-rotted definitive like I do, these are really just, you know, a, a nice extra to have. And just for reference, I do have the faces letterboxed on VHS, so I can show you what those look like, so you can get an idea what the covers are. Now, of course, uh, this is a nice VHS slip box, very gorgeously done, uh, but it's exactly the same as the uh, faces laser disc, just on VHS type. So just a simple slip box, but the uh, faces for Star War for A New Hope and Empire look like this on Laserdisc. And here, of course, is the Jedi faces cover. And as you can see, these were pretty much designed for tape dimensions and then just expanded for Laserdisc. And uh, if you ever are curious about finding these on tape and widescreen, the way you can tell the difference is the tiny widescreen collector's edition bar across the top. Otherwise, they look identical to the uh, standard pan and scan discs. Sorry, pan and scan tapes. Let me show you this. And here you get a full color rear cover, but it's pretty much the same text size down for tape. And just for curiosity's sake, here is the Empire rear and the New Hope rear. So this is just to give you an idea of what the whole uh, Faces campaign looked like in 1995. And this is what a lot of people grew up watching or had for years. And actually, when most people say that, you know, they talk about the original Star Wars and they have their old uh, VCR tapes or their, uh, their, even if they are on Laserdisc, they're almost always going to be talking about this run. Uh, again, this was the last uh, major run of the uh, you know, supposedly original editions before the special edition. And again, these masters are what are on those uh, limited edition bonus DVD discs. But it's quite rare to see them in the tape variety, so that's why I picked that up. Now, of course, this brings us to the dreaded to some people special edition. Of course, what most people don't realize is in this day and age, there are now at least three special editions. The 1997, which was released in theaters for the 20th anniversary of Star Wars, and then on tape and Laserdisc. Then there was the 2004 DVD special edition that introduced the horrible color timing, uh, the awful sound remixes filled with errors, and uh, all of the really awful stuff in addition to innumerable more changes that were even worse than the ones done in 97 and then followed by the 2011 Blu-ray Special Edition, which although it corrected some things from the DVDs, it introduced more changes of its own and introduced more technical problems and is itself outdated in every way and another god-awful mess. So most people just lump it all together as one Special Edition and thus the 97 Special Edition really gets a bum rap today when most people have either not seen it since 97 or don't realize there are multiple special editions. So when I talk about the special edition, I'm pretty much only talking about the 97 version. And the only way you can actually see it on in this day and age outside of a very, very rare theatrical print screening that Lucasfilm actually allows uh, is on tape and laser disc. So here is the US NTSC special edition trilogy laser disc box set. 
like using the uh, special edition artwork that was used on the uh, VHS trilogy boxes and all the uh, special edition uh, promo art. It's an, again in a nice leathery styled box set. This one's much simpler. It's just a uh, slip sleeve style, much like some of the Disney boxes. There's the logo. I don't know if this is gonna turn up, but it just has the special edition trilogy logo with the Lucasfilm Dolby AC3, THX, and Fox logos in silver, which is quite nice. And here on the rear, they've actually added the stylized special edition style logos for each of the films, and I've always loved these, so that's really nice. And just the legal stuff. Now again, because it's just a slip sleeve, it's pretty simplistic, but what's nice is you get the chapter insert booklet has the Drew Struzan special edition posters for all three with the credits on the bottom. So it's just a very, very nice, very stylish looking jacket. Unfortunately, these didn't get uh, gatefolds with the Drew Struzan posters. That would have been really nice. And surprisingly, these didn't get individual releases. It was this box set or nothing. So that's, that's kind of interesting. But I guess that was... Uh, Probably because this is getting towards the end of the format. Maybe they didn't feel like it, or they just figured most people were buying them on tape, which they were. So here is the booklet with tons of nice text. And most of this is on the uh, VHS covers, if you still have those. So it's not a whole lot of new stuff, but there is a little bit of added stuff because it's a whole uh, laser disc panel. There's the other one. And then on the rear, you have all the chapters indexed for each film. Uh, all three are spread out across uh, pretty much, yeah, it runs right onto nine sides, and then there's a little bit of uh, special features at the end. The special features pretty much uh, take the little documentary pieces that were at the start of the special edition tapes spread, across, spread, uh, the, spread out across the three tapes, and they're actually combined in one nice little uh, about half hour, 35 minute documentary. And so it's actually really interesting to actually see it all together for a change with uh, PCM audio. And then you get the three special edition trailers, which are all fantastic. So. Um, Moving on to the technical quality of the discs themselves, the transfers are excellent for the time period. They have great detail, great color, and they have the brand new at the time special edition sound mixes in both uh, Dolby Surround encoded PCM and uh, Dolby 5.1 AC3. When they did these, uh, they went back and tried to maintain the theatrical intent as much as possible while adding all of the uh, alternates from the mono mixes and things that were intended to be there. The idea was to create the final ultimate mix for each of the three films. And what's also really great is they kept to not only the original track design, uh, you know, based around a left, center, right, surround four track system for all three, uh, even though they were uh, shown in 70 millimeter six track, they were designed around the uh, four channel uh, setup idea, and that's what the masters themselves are. Um, but they brought that into a 5.1 environment, retaining a uh, full dynamic range. So these are very boisterous, very loud. The uh, uh, surround design is very open. They sound wonderful in a home theater environment. They're not 100% authentic because you know it's a different system, and this was 1997. But uh, for maintaining fidelity to the original source, these are actually quite good. And these are the last good sounding releases of these films, period. Basically what they did after this point was they took these 97 5.1 mixes and remixed them into 5.1 EX and later 6.1. Uh, ruined the dynamic range, drastically reduced it. The DVDs uh, frequently flipped the surround channels, uh, and then they added all the new effects and things twice over, first for the DVDs and secondly for the Blu-rays. And they essentially ruined all the work done in 1997. Um, so I would definitely recommend these for the audio tracks alone, which are excellent and should be pretty much identical to what you would have heard in the uh, theatrical special edition release. Um, and if you don't have AC3 capability, the PCM surround is equally good. It's the same source mix. 
you're not going to get the same level of discrete channel usage as you do from the AC3. Uh, but if you grew up on the special edition VHS tapes, you were essentially getting a uh, a uh, version of this PCM on the uh, VHS tapes. And they do still sound quite excellent. They are one of the best tracks I've heard for a uh, PCM stereo surround fold down of 5.1. So either way, they sound excellent. And this set is worth it for the audio alone. Of course, the special editions aren't for everybody, but I, I do recommend this set. It is, you know, not super expensive. Again, because it's Star Wars, you'll probably have to pay a little bit more, um, but it can be had for a, a, a not not too much and the audio is excellent now something i should mention is uh, for some reason the master on star wars um, and this was common during the video era for colors to kind of um, kind of go off for a little bit uh, during some of the Mos Eisley scenes and some of the tattooing sequences earlier on you'll notice it kind of gets a pink tint in the uh, especially in the outdoor scenes and during that section um, Nobody knows why it happens. It just seems to be a mastering mistake. It's not really bad. It doesn't exactly detract from this, but um, it is noticeable if you know the films as well as I do. Um, and it seems to have been on the VHS tapes of this at the same time. However, I don't know. I think people have said it's not on the Japanese pressing of this box set, so that is something to note. And other people have said the Japanese pressing may be a little bit sharper and a little bit cleaner. But of course, it usually goes for a lot more money because it's Japanese and you have to deal with hard-coded Japanese subtitles. Whereas this set, that's really the only issue and you don't have to deal with those. Now you get beautiful custom labels with the Vader artwork. This is easily the best uh, Laserdisc label for the Star Wars trilogy. And even though uh, it's the same on all three films, it's just nice to have a special box set uh, label for these. And they're all in these very nice uh, Trilogy Special Edition stamped black jackets that are poly-lined, so they all go in here very nicely. And it's just a nice, simple, straightforward box set for the Special Edition. Now, as I mentioned, there is a Japanese box set. It uses this same basic artwork, but again, it usually goes for a lot more money. Uh, later on, I think in about 1999, 2000, they repressed it with the updated uh, VHS artwork from the la one of the last tape releases, kind of more like what was used on the prequels for the tape artwork. That one uh, is supposedly even better than the uh, 97 Japanese set because it came out a couple years later but is of course even rarer, even more expensive but it's still pretty much the same as this box set that will cost you a lot less. So I highly recommend this for Laserdisc collectors and Star Wars historians or if you're just curious about the uh, 97 set or uh, if you want a Laserdisc with really great audio, I highly recommend those. And of course, that's still the best official release out there because past tape and laser disc, the 97s were completely uh, forgotten to history as a footnote. Now, if you thought we were done with Star Wars, there's one more to go. And this is one that I think pretty much all collectors should have, even though the film still is reviled uh, by most people these days, and really unfairly, I think. I think. Uh, I think the backlash this film got in 1999 is still kind of in effect, and I think if more people went to it with an open mind, uh, you know, they'd realize that it, it still plays pretty well even after all this time. Um, and honestly, it might play even better because people don't have all those expectations uh, attached to it. But I'm of course talking about the laser disc release of Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Now, of course, this was only released in Japan and is a late release disc. It didn't even get released over here in the States, and I think a lot of people imported it uh, over here because you can usually find it at a decent price, uh, much more so than other late release discs and Japanese only discs. I think a lot of people did that because it took the film two years to arrive on DVD. And other than this, you were stuck with a VHS release. Now, of course, this is the theatrical cut of the film. Uh, the film was recut starting on the DVD with new scenes added, other scenes removed, and the audio was ostensibly remixed and uh, essentially tamed down quite a bit from the original uh, Dolby Digital EX. 
which you actually find on this laser disc on the AC3 track. So this laser disc is important for a number of reasons, and I, I would highly recommend it to any laser disc fan, collector, or uh, Star Wars fan, even though the film itself does not have a very good reputation. The theatrical cut, I think, works a lot better. Um, admittedly, the differences are all rather minor, but the theatrical cut flows better. All the additions and changes made on the DVD and Blu-ray cuts really are just non-important fluff that makes the film more bloated and longer and actually enhances some of the problems a lot of people have with it. So I again would recommend the theatrical cut and this is the only official way to see it other than VHST. Now the cover itself uses the original artwork and this of course most people would recognize from the posters, the ad campaigns, and of course the VHS release. And you can see this is pretty much sized for that. And uh, you have the tagline and the THX digitally mastered stamp on here, which I think is pretty cool. I've always loved that logo design, even though the THX mastering on video really didn't always add up to ultimate and premium picture and sound quality. But since that this was usually reserved for VHS releases, I think it's really nice to see the whole printing on the Laserdisc jacket. Uh, the gate fold. It's admittedly pretty nice. It's a shot of Theed Palace, and you know it looks very nice and gives you a sense of the world building they were trying to do. Um, I don't know if I myself would have gone with that. I probably would have chosen a still from the Pod Race or Coruscant or uh, the Space Battle at the end. No, I would have just used a still from the Final Lightsaber Duel. But for for what it is, it's quite nice. Now, of course, here on the other side, you have your chapter breakdowns. The film makes it the film makes it onto three sides. And, of course, being a Japanese disc, all the chapters are in Japanese. So if you're not fluent in your Japanese, you're just going to have to chapter skip and figure out where to go. Now, here on the rear cover, this is pretty much the same design that was used for the VHS release, so it'll look familiar if you ever had that. And of course, if you can imagine all the Japanese printing being in English, you can pretty much picture what the American Laserdisc that never happened would have looked like. Would have pretty much looked identical to this. Of course, it has no special features or anything. That Those all came out uh, on the DVD, which admittedly had a really nice supplemental section. So this is just a movie-only disc. And uh, again, I would recommend it highly just for the theatrical cut and the audio alone. The picture quality is, is something we'll have to talk about though because I, when I got this disc I was actually quite surprised to see that the uh, picture quality was not really up there with top tier disc even though it is a late Japanese only release. So I was quite surprised over that. First of all you have to adjust your display because this disc is mastered at the different IRE brightness level as most Japanese discs are. So once you do that, you know, you, and it's you, you, very noticeable if you don't, um, you have to make sure it's not too dark and not too bright. Um, the difference is here in the States, we're at one level, and in Japan, they were at another. And Japanese discs are kind of hit or miss. Uh, they should be at the different level, but not all of them are. So even if, even if it's the same master in both countries, they could be at different brightness levels, and you'll have to adjust for that. So once that's out of the way, I don't know what they may have done to this transfer, but it has an overly like processed feel and look to it. And I don't know exactly what happened. It's not really a case of noise reduction being overzealous like the old uh, Definitive Collection Master. Uh, it doesn't have any motion smearing or anything, but it just has this very processed look to it. And it doesn't look anywhere near as good as late release Laserdisc can. Um, and again, I don't really know how to describe it, but if you actually look at this disc, you'll, you'll be able to see for yourself. It's by no means a, a bad uh, you know, laser disc in terms of picture and video quality, but it's definitely not top tier and uh, you know definitely doesn't feel like a late release disc. So that is something to keep in mind. Uh, I, I'd rate it much closer to being average for picture quality because of that. Um, so just don't pick this up and put it in expecting it to be the best looking laser disc you've ever seen because it's not going to be and you'll be sorely disappointed. Um, but the color is good and there is you know good detail in there once you get over the fact that it's not going to ever look that great. Again, I just wish I knew what had gone on because it, it 
I don't think it should have been released this way. I think it could have looked amazing and should look amazing, but it just doesn't. Now, uh, the audio is the really important part, though. Um, you know, again, this is the theatrical cut, but it comes with a Dolby Digital track and a uh, surrounding coded Dolby PCM track. Now, uh, Phantom Menace was the first film to use the Dolby EX process in theaters. If you saw it on the original theatrical run in a high-end theater that had the correct equipment. Dolby EX, to put it very simply, was a uh, methodology of using the existing 5.1 AC3 standard and matrixing in a center rear channel into the left and right surrounds. The idea being that in a properly equipped high-end theater with the correct new decoder that could decode EX, it would pull that extra sixth channel for the center rear portion of the auditorium out of the rear surrounds. And thus, you could put speakers in along the back wall in the dead center of the auditorium, and thus it would pull out a sixth main channel in the center rear. And thus you get extra effects coming from directly behind you in terms of your headspace. And uh, it was a really interesting thing. It was the first real advancement that had come in the modern digital sound era for, uh, in terms of uh, cinema formats. Uh, it was the first time anybody had really moved beyond the 5.1 standard. Now, very few theaters really adopted this. It wasn't really publicized outside of trade articles and magazines at the time. Uh, DTS came up with their own version called DTS-ES, which uh, it was the same idea but just worked in a different way. And again, you know, not every film had this and not every theater had this. And it never really took off in, in the uh, cinema world, but on home video, it started to during the DVD era, and DTS eventually came out with a discrete 6.1 ES system. Uh, but eventually, uh, I think it was THX that decided 6.1 and the Matrix varieties were not a good format because it could cause listener confusion, and they decided to split it into two and thus have a stereo rear spread and thus created the 7.1 format. Uh, which premiered with Toy Story 3 back in 2007. So pretty much 6.1 and the uh, 5.1 EX and ES tracks have all been sidestepped in favor of just leaving them 5.1 or jumping right over to 7.1. And the whole 6.1 era in film sound has kind of been forgotten as a footnote. So I, I think it's really interesting to go back and I think it's important to understand how this stuff worked. But for all intents and purposes, when it was remixed for DVD, it seems like a lot of the dynamics were tamed. Um, the remix isn't necessarily bad, and if you put them side by side, you might not notice a difference at first, but I think the, this audio track on this Laserdisc is far better, and it's one of the best audio tracks on the format, period. It is a powerhouse 5.1 mix. Uh, you know, this is uh, Ben Burt and everybody on the sound team working at the top of their game at the end of the 90s, the end of the century, uh, you know, really just trying to give uh, the whole 5.1 format a run for its money and what you could do in the uh, within the format parameters itself. So it's a phenomenal track. I think it's the best sounding release hands down. And the, uh, if you don't have AC3 capability, the PCM surround version is a viable alternative. It's a fold down of the 5.1 and sounds excellent on its own. Of course, you're not gonna get the full discrete usage as, on the, as you do on the AC3, just like if you aren't able to play AC3 on the special editions. So it's no slouch, but you're really coming to this for the AC3 track, which is historically important and fantastic. Again, this is the theatrical cut, and this is the best official release of the theatrical cut because outside of this, you're stuck watching it on a pan and scan VHS tape, unless you found one of the rare letterbox releases, which loses even more resolution. So even, I, and again, I think a lot of people imported this disc. So if you're patient, you can pick it up on eBay, usually for about $20 or so with or without the OB strip. So I was very pleased to finally pick this up uh, again, I think the theatrical cut plays a lot better than the uh, longer versions, and uh, the Blu-ray is just, it should be great, 
and a modern scan could be fantastic for this film. Uh, unfortunately, they uh, they actually presented the full scope width of this film. Uh, for some reason, during the original mastering process, the original scope width was compromised on the tape, laser disc, and DVD releases, so it's slightly cropped on the sides due to a technical error. So the Blu-ray is the first time you see the entirety of the image. Um, it's pretty much just some on either side. Uh, it doesn't severely compromise any of the earlier versions, but that's the one advantage of having the Blu-ray. Unfortunately, they subjected the film then to so much digital noise reduction that practically all grain is removed and it's a waxy nightmare. And again, has color timing changes. The soundtrack was remixed again unnecessarily and it's just a messy nightmare and an awful Blu-ray. So even though this is not optimal for picture quality, as far as I'm concerned, this is the only decent video release of the Phantom Menace period uh, due to the incessant uh, bad video history of all the Star Wars films in the modern era and the refusal of people to actually make proper unaltered uh, editions in this day and age. And for such popular films, it's actually completely ridiculous to not do so. Anyway, uh, I would argue this laser disc is extremely important. I think everybody with a collection should track one of these down. And you know, even if you don't like the film, give it another shot. Uh, the audio mix it itself is just, it, it makes this a must own. But the fact that this actually maintains the theatrical cut, which is otherwise unavailable, uh, it just doubles that. So. Um, Again, really great to have the theatrical cut and the uh, original audio mix, but the picture quality sadly is not quite what it should be. Um, so again, just keep that in mind and just if you manage to finally find an affordable copy, absolutely go for it. I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised and particularly those with AC3 demodulators will be very pleased. So that's going to do it for Star Wars on Laserdisc. Again, this was just meant to be a sort of, uh, you know, a brief overhaul and look at the various uh, letterbox versions and then the history of the various masters. So in short, to summarize, for those who are looking for, you know, just the original trilogy on Laserdisc without, you know, uh, the special edition changes, Grab the, the Fox Special Widescreen Editions, the plain American ones. They will get you the most bang for your buck. And you're essentially getting the Japanese Special Collections for far less money on CLV platters. And uh, you can get all three for about 15 bucks, as opposed to the exorbitant prices for the Defended in Box and the Japanese Special Collection Disc. Of course, uh, everything Star Wars related uh, automatically has that price markup almost built into it so you will have to be careful for that and obviously pay a little bit more simply because things are Star Wars discs. Um, most of all I would advise seeking out the Technodisc pressing of Star Wars, that reissue pressing, but again it's going to take a lot of time and patience but it is well worth it. So I would recommend overall having the special widescreen trilogy and the Technodisc pressing if you're just looking for uh, great releases to have, period, no frills, you don't care about extras or features, uh, then the Faces discs are going to do you just fine. Uh, but just keep in mind they have all the deficiencies of the definitive THX Master built into them. So if uh, you pick these up and then you, you find you're kind of tired of that or you want to see something more vintage or some more color in it, you can also always pick up the special widescreen editions uh, and you can have both. So that's an easy recommendation. I'd also recommend having the special edition set and the Japanese Phantom Menace just for completion's sake and because they are relatively Laserdisc exclusive because they were never reissued again and because they have phenomenal uh, PCM and AC3 tracks. So uh, that's going to do it for this segment. Uh, next, I'm going to go through uh, all the new arrivals that have come in and ones I hadn't shelved yet uh, when I started this video series. So uh, stay tuned for that and thanks for watching. This has been my most requested uh, video for some time and I've always wanted to make a video supplement uh, for the 
all the times I get asked about Star Wars on Laserdisc. So um, hopefully this this helps people, and especially uh, helps people who are just starting to Laserdisc or trying to figure out the various forms of Star Wars on Laserdisc in both here in the States and in Japan. And uh, you know, hopefully so you can get an idea of how they uh, fell over the course of the uh, video era.